This is the 48th semi-annual TACSM lecture here at UT Arlington. And if you look in your handout, you'll see that it's a list of really who's who in exercise science. And we're going to be adding to this list today um, with Dr. Scott Smith. Um, we have, I'll mention one of uh, our previous lecturers here, um, Dr. Peter Raven, who gave this lecture in 1999, and who Scott Smith knows all too well. Um, just a little bit of background about Dr. Smith. He got his undergrad degree in biology and chemistry from Southwestern in Georgetown. He went on to get his master's and PhD at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth under the mentorship of Dr. Raven. So any tough questions you might have for Dr. Smith, you can say for Dr. I'll Raven. defer, I'll After defer. The fact. Um, he then went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship at UT Southwestern uh, Medical Center in Dallas in one of the uh, leading cardiovascular research labs in the country. Uh, under the guidance of Dr. Jerry Mitchell. Um, Dr. Smith started as a faculty member at UT Southwestern in 2002, um, where he's gone on to earn the rank of associate professor. He has published over 30 uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, numerous abstracts, and other presentations. In fact, here at, at UT Arlington, he's given uh, multiple lectures here before. Um, Invited, some invited. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I just show up and start talking. Okay. Um, he's also had a, a solid uh, grant <coughs> funding history, including R01 funding from the National Institutes of Health um, to investigate the exercise pressure reflex overactivity and hypertension. And um, on a personal note, um, we allow him to compete in our fantasy football league. Um, so you mean you allow me to win your fantasy football league? The other week, yes. But <laughs> um, nonetheless, let's uh, give a round of applause for Dr. Scott Smith. <laughs> uh, thank you for that wonderful, uh, uh, what do you call it, introduction, to Dr. Keller. Um, as Dr. Keller said, I've been able to come over to UTA a few times. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come over here. Uh, really enjoy it. The campus is great. The only problem is as I walk over here to the Mac, all I want to do is go get my gym shorts on and start shooting some hoops or, I mean, you guys even got a rock climbing wall. Although for a little guy like me, I don't think I want to do that because if I get to the top, that's a long fall for me. So I'm not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk to you guys today uh, is about exercise uh, and basically exercise at the development of hypertension. You guys all know hypertension is just the development of chronic high blood pressure. And we're going to look at a particular reflex and ask the question, do, does this reflex make exercising in hypertension a risky proposition? Okay, uh, and this is just a picture of uh, UT Southwestern. Has any of you guys been over to UT Southwestern before? Raise your hands if you have. Okay, do we have, uh, I know there's a few joint programs that we have over there. Um, so it's not too long of a drive. It's also a fairly large campus that uh, here's the north side of campus, the south side of campus, connected by a... Uh, a uh, uh, what do you call that? Connected by a long road. <laughs> that, a shuttle, a shuttle system. Thank you. Uh, so if you guys ever have a chance to come over there and want to uh, visit, I'll always be happy to entertain you and bring you, but maybe I'll take you to get some lunch at the faculty club or something like that. Uh, let's see. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So, just a little outline of what we're going to talk about today uh, with regard to exercise and hypertension. First, we're just going to review what the normal cardiovascular response to exercise is. Uh, then we're going to talk about some of the neural mechanisms that are very important for this cardiovascular control during exercise. Then we're going to get into more of the skeletal muscle reflexes. That's a reflex that we're going to discuss today and how it may or may not be altered after the development of hypertension and hypertensive individuals. And we'll use an animal model to really look at this, uh, an animal model of human hypertension. And then we'll conclude and talk a little bit about why is this important and what's the relevance of this research. <coughs> So 
So to begin, just to review what the normal cardiovascular response to exercise is. Uh, I have two panels here, one looking at the cardiovascular response to dynamic exercise. This would be exercise more like cycling, running, uh, anything in where there's on, off muscle contractions. And we'll also look at what the response is to static exercise. And static exercise would be more like an isometric hand grip where tension uh, is developed within the muscle and then maintained. Okay, and in actuality, in any exercise that we do, there are aspects of both dynamic and static to every motion that we have. But there is dis discrete differences between the cardiovascular response between the two. So let's start looking first at dynamic exercise, and this is over a period of time. You can see that as uh, you continue to exercise, your rate of oxygen uptake increases. Uh, also, you get very large increases in cardiac output. Now, as you know, cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. So uh, this increase in cardiac output is mediated by both increases in rate of the heart <clears throat> as well as the amount of blood that the heart is be, uh, pumping with each beat. This uh, leads to an increase in systolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, whereas diastolic blood pressure tends to either not change or go down a little bit. And this is actually very interesting. If you look at total peripheral resistance from baseline, your total peripheral resistance actually goes down. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this. The blood pressure is the product of cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. So if peripheral resistance is going down, these increases that you see in blood pressure have to be mediated exclusively by these large increases in cardiac output. Okay? That's the situation in dynamic exercise. What about static exercise? A little bit different. Again, over a period of time, and notice it's a shorter period of time for this exercise, as this tends to be more strenuous and, and difficult to maintain. Uh, you get Again, increases in rate of oxygen consumption, not quite as large as during dynamic exercise. You also get increases in uh, cardiac output. <clears throat> Again, not as large as during dynamic exercise. You get large increases in heart rate, but the difference here is that stroke volume doesn't really change much uh, and may actually even go down. Therefore, if heart cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume, then these increases that you see in cardiac output in this particular case are mediated exclusively by the increases in rate, not changes in stroke volume. But now let's look at the blood pressure response. Uh, we get, again, increases in systolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, and diastolic blood pressure. But these increases are quite a bit larger than you see during dynamic exercise. And <clears throat> one of the main reasons is because unlike the situation in dynamic exercise, peripheral resistance either does not change or actually will increase slightly. So despite the fact that cardiac output doesn't go up as much as in dynamic exercise and static exercise, because there's no real change in peripheral resistance, we drive these larger changes in blood pressure. Now, it's these cardiovascular responses that are responsible for uh, all that we do or w all we're able to physically do when we're exercising. Um, and the intent is to increase the delivery of blood flow, carrying oxygen to skeletal muscle that is currently performing a particular activity. Without these alterations, Dirk wouldn't be able to uh, dunk the ball. Um, and he's been working with me on that. I've almost got it to where I can touch the bottom of the net. Uh, Nastia Lucan uh, wouldn't be able to do what she does on the, I think that's the uneven bars. Uh, Serena Williams wouldn't be able to win Wimbledon, although did she win this year? She didn't win, but she got close. She made, she made the finals, semifinals, quarterfinals. She didn't play. She didn't play. <laughs> well, if she would have played, she would have won. <laughs> and it would have been a cardiovascular system that helped her in part. Uh, Michael Phelps winning how umpteenth million gold medals he won at the last Summer Olympics, as well as Usain Bolt. All what these guys all have in common is that when they're exercising, they have to utilize the cardiovascular system, shunt blood away from non-exercising tissue, shunt blood to exercising muscle that's carrying oxygen that allows that skeletal muscle to generate its metabolism, generate energy so they can contract the muscle and perform the activity. <clears throat> So we ask a question, it sounds like exercise is a great thing and exercise training also has a lot of benefits to it. You know, you increase muscle strength, um, you increase your endurance, your respiratory endurance, um, you can remodel different tissues. Um, what's wrong with exercise? 
are there any situations or conditions in which exercise may not be re recommended and could actually do more harm than good? And the answer to this question is, is quite complex and not straightforward, but so I'm going to waver a little bit and say perhaps and give you an example of people that have developed hypertension. Is exercise not necessarily a beneficial thing for these individuals? And just a little, what is hypertension? I said already, of course, hypertension is a disease characterized by chronic high blood pressure. Um, it's a, a disease that is on the rise in prevalence within the United States. Uh, currently, around 32% of our uh, population, age 20 or older, has developed hypertension. And wh why is having high blood pressure a bad thing? Um, of course, I'm not going to talk about a lot of pathology today, but uh, it really is a major risk factor for the development of a lot of different uh, bad things such as heart disease, peripheral arterial disease, stroke, heart failure, etc. So prolonged increases in, in blood pressure cause our cardiovascular system to work harder on a beat-to-beat -beat basis and over time this can have deleterious effects that lead to the development of certain diseases. That being said, still why wouldn't we want to exercise if we're hypertensive? Well, one of the answers may be to look just at the basic overall cardiovascular response to exercise in hypertension. This is a study done by a group out of Japan uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, any of you guys born in the early 80s? I always feel old. Any of you born in the 90s? Oh, that's so sad. Okay, I was born in the great 70s, uh, actually the first day of 1970. <laughs> so, <laughs> there are some 70s in here? 60s, all right, I like it. We got a 20s represented right here. <laughs> Anybody for the 30s? Okay. We can, after, we'll just all talk about nostalgic things from our eras. How about that? Anyway, uh, this is a group out of Japan, and they looked at the uh, blood pressure response to isometric hand grip exercise. Uh, they did this, they performed it at 30% of maximal voluntary contraction. So I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with this, but basically you do a, a static muscle contraction at maximum intensity, and then when they performed the exercise, they did 30% of that intensity for a period of like three minutes. And they looked at the response in uh, four group of patients or individuals, one, a normal intensive group of individuals, a borderline hypertensive group of individuals, a mildly hypertensive group of individuals, and markedly hypertensive group. And you can see whenever they started exercising, the normal intensive individuals, they had n very nice large increases in systolic blood pressure. In this particular case, they also had uh, pretty good increases in diastolic blood pressure. But if you looked at the, all three of the hypertensive groups, they had much larger increases in systolic blood pressure than your normal tensive group. And there was a trend for this also in diastolic blood pressure. <clears throat> so it appears, at least in response to static exercise, there is an exaggerated increase in blood pressure in these hypertensive individuals. Now, I'm sure you can all see how this could be a, a problem. We already said they have high blood pressure to begin with. So when they start exercising, their pressure is high and now you're increasing it even more and to a higher level than you normally would during an exercise bout. Uh, and this again would, could lead to uh, some deleterious effects we'll talk about in a moment. Now that's the situation in static exercise. <clears throat> what about dynamic exercise? And this is just a, a nice little study that was done by an Italian group uh, back in the early 90s where they looked at, again, uh, normal tensive versus hypertensive individuals uh, during uh, cycling, and this is very moderate cycling, only at 10 watts, um, and their normal tensive group had blood pressures of 120 over 80, so systolic over diastolic, uh, and their hypertensive group was very hypertensive, especially uh, diastolic hypertension, they were 160 over 112. Um, and in response to this dynamic exercise cycling, <clears throat> uh, you can see in your normal tensive individuals, again, very large increases in systolic blood pressure from what we learned er in the earlier slide, the increases in diastolic pressure are much less, okay, because this is a dynamic form of exercise. But when you looked at the hypertensive individuals, they had, again, larger increases in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So it's not just a static exercise that you see these exaggerated responses. You'll also see them during dynamic ex forms of exercise, such as um, cycling, running, walking, these types of things. So why? So again, 
why is this a bad thing? Um, as I said, you already have the baseline blood pressure that's high, and now you exercise and you drive it to even higher levels. So that leads you to an increased risk for a lot of different things during the exercise bout or immediately after the exercise bout, including stroke, arrhythmia, that would be dysregulation or, or taking your heart rate out of rhythm, uh, acute myocardial infarction, which a lot of times is just a fancy name for a heart attack, you stop blood flow to a particular portion of the heart, uh, and that can lead to cardiac arrest and in extreme cases sudden cardiac death. Okay, now I'm not saying that hypertensive individuals that, uh, that exercise are all going to fall down and die. Uh, I'm just saying that your risk for that is increased with this particular disease state and these cardiovascular responses. <clears throat> so what my lab has been working on um, uh, in conjunction with a couple of other labs is to determine what is causing these abnormally large cardiovascular responses uh, to exercise in these hypertensive individuals. Now there are several candidates for this and basically we're, we're looking primarily at the neural control of the cardiovascular system. So just normally there are three neural inputs that are very important to controlling the cardiovascular system during exercise. The first is central command. <clears throat> central command is a feed forward uh, input that uh, is activated really in anticipation of the exercise bout and continues to be activated throughout exercise. Um, it originates within the cerebral cortex of the brain and it sends signals uh, first to motor neurons to actually recruit motor units so you can contract skeletal muscle and move. Um, but at the same time that it does that, it sends signals to these cardiovascular centers within the brainstem that are primarily housed within the medulla oblongata. So that's the first uh, mechanism. <clears throat> the second is the arterial barrel reflex. And the arterial barrel reflex has receptors and associated sensory neurons or afferent fibers that are located in the carotid uh, sinus and in the uh, aortic arch. Uh, these receptors sense changes in blood pressure on a moment to moment basis. Uh, when we're at rest, what they do is they try to keep blood pressure fairly constant so that if our blood pressure increases, they induce changes that bring blood pressure down. And, uh, if my, and vice versa, if my blood pressure decreases, they will cause things to cause blood pressure to go back up. Now, uh, as you, we just saw, blood pressure and heart rate and all these things go all go up during exercise. So you might think that means, well, I just, you just told me that this was going to keep blood pressure from going up. What happens is this particular reflex resets during exercise, and it continues to operate, but it operates now at the uh, more the higher levels established, uh, higher levels of pressure established by the exercise bout. And it basically helps us from getting too high of a blood pressure response to exercise. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the second uh, mechanism. The third is uh, what we're really going to concentrate here on today is uh, reflexes originating from skeletal muscle. And these are known primarily as the exercise press reflex. And when we contract skeletal muscle, uh, that muscle both uh, distorts itself mechanically and it also starts producing different chemical byproducts from the work it's performing, metabolism. Um, and these stretching or mechanically deforming receptors in this muscle and the metabolic byproducts that are produced by that exercise, they uh, stimulate receptors that then send sensory information uh, back through the spinal cord to the same cardiovascular center in the brainstem. So we have three inputs to the, these cardiovascular centers within the medulla oblongata or the brainstem uh, that help regulate the cardiovascular response to exercise. Cinch, one from central command, one from the arterial bell reflex, and then one from the skeletal muscle reflexes. Okay. Now what do each of these do? Um, one, they primarily re, uh, shut down, or not shut down is not the right word, but they reduce parasympathetic nerve activity to the heart. And everybody familiar with parasympathetic nerve activity? It's mediated primarily through the vagal nerve. Parasympathetic activity uh, normally reduces heart rate. So if we reduce the amount of parasympathetic activity to the heart, the result's going to be an increase in the rate of the heart. Okay? And that goes along with what we saw earlier. Um, but primarily, these reflexes are going to control the sympathetic nervous system. Okay? The sympathetic nerve activity to the heart will increase, and that will cause an increase in heart rate. It will also increase to... Uh, the vasculature to the resistance arteries and capacitance veins. This would be one way that we can, one, sh shut down blood flow to non-active skeletal muscle or non-active tissue. And in another way, will help us maintain peripheral resistance 
or increased peripheral resistance. And it also sends increases sympathetic activity to the adrenal, adrenal gland in the, uh, excuse me, the adrenal gland that sits on top of the kidney. The adrenal gland has, uh, produces what's called catecholamines, uh, primarily epinephrine. That will go into our bloodstream and circulate back to these heart and uh, blood vessels and have the similar effects, increasing heart rate, increased resistance. Okay. So these reflexes act in a concerted manner to make precise adjustments in heart rate, stroke volume, contractility, and resistance. So in hypertension then, <clears throat> this abnormal cardiovascular response that we see could be due to alterations in the function of any one of these neural inputs. It could be changes in central command that are causing it. Maybe the arterial bell reflex is not working correctly. Maybe the skeletal muscle reflex isn't working correctly. We've done previous research in other disease states like heart failure that shows that the altered cardiovascular responses are mediated by the skeletal muscle reflex. So our lab is concentrated first on determining if the skeletal muscle reflex contributes to the altered cardiovascular response to exercise that you see in hypertension. So let's take a little bit closer examination of what the exercise pressure reflex is. Okay, it's just this, as I said, it's this uh, reflex that originates in skeletal muscle. Okay, and it basically has two components that are important for its function. The first is known as the muscle mechanical reflex. Okay, and it is uh, when you contract muscle and you distort the receptive fields of receptors located in that muscle, they stimulate a group of, of afferent fibers or sensory neurons that are known as group 3A delta fibers. So these group 3A del delta fibers are stimulated by the mechanical distortion of the uh, receptive fields of these uh, receptors in skeletal muscle. And when activated, they send signals back to those same cardiovascular centers within the brainstem. The second component is the muscle metabol reflex. And the muscle metabol reflex <coughs> um, has receptors in skeletal muscle that are responsive to the metabolic byproducts of the skeletal muscle work itself. So when a skeletal muscle cell works, it produces energy. It also produces a lot of different byproducts or waste products. These include potassium, hydrogen, lactic acid, phosphate, a whole host of different things that are released from the muscle. These things go bind to those uh, chemically sensitive receptors in the muscle and stimulate sensory neurons that are primarily group 4 C fibers that also send signals back to those same cardiovascular centers within the brainstem. So the, the exercise pressure reflex as a whole has two component parts that when both are activated while we exercise to send signals back to this brainstem so that we can basically tell our muscle can tell our brain how hard it's working so that we can then make a decision on how much blood we want to send to that muscle. Okay. So once the signals are sent back here to the, the uh, brainstem uh, in these cardiovascular centers within the brainstem, uh, decisions are made, the information is processed, and then we get those changes in vagal or parasympathetic and sympathetic efferent activity. Remember from the previous slide, parasympathetic activity decreases and sympathetic activity uh, markedly increases. So the exercise press reflex primarily changes heart rate and blood pressure by increasing sympathetic activity during exercise. And this results in those increases in heart rate, contractility, cardiac output, uh, peripheral resistance that uh, wind up leading to increases in blood pressure. So the question, uh, our next question then is, um, is this exercise pressure reflex responsible for the abnormal cardiovascular response to exercise in hypertension. Now this is a difficult question to answer in humans. Um, and can anybody guess why? Well, one restart strategy would be really if we're going to look at one particular input, we need to isolate that input, right? And in, in a person, um, whenever we start exercising, we're going to engage the central command, we're going to engage the barrel reflex, we're going to engage the mu muscle reflex all at the same time. And therefore it's very difficult to discern what one reflex or one input is functioning and doing from another. Okay, so we often use animal models to help us uh, 
differentiate between these particular inputs. And so we developed in our lab an, an animal model of exercise and we basically use rats that allows us to preferentially stimulate just the exercise pressure reflex while eliminating input from central command as well as the barrel reflex. So we can eliminate input from central command and the barrel reflex. Now we can just look at how the exercise pressure reflex is functioning in this particular model. And the way we do this, this is uh, we do a little spinal surgery on these animals, uh, do a procedure called a spinal laminectomy. We expose the spinal cord at its lower lumbar uh, segments and off of these segments come ventral roots and these ventral roots carry motor axons in them, motor neurons. <coughs> These motor neurons innervate skeletal muscle in the hind limb. So if I go and cut the ventral root where it exits the spinal cord and put a stimulating electrode here, I can send an electrical current through this uh, stimulating electrode that will activate those motor neurons that will then cause this muscle to contract. Okay? And I can do it in a rhythmic fashion or a static fashion. Uh, what it does also allows is once this muscle contracts, we're going to start activating all those receptors in the skeletal muscle, and they're going to activate those sensory neurons. And those sensory neurons are going to want to go send this information back to the brain. So the sensory information comes back, and you see where this split is? This split here, this is a ventral root, and the, the sensory information comes back in what's known as the dorsal root. Okay? So I leave the dorsal roots intact so that I can artificially stimulate this muscle so it contracts while leaving the sensory pathway intact so the information can get back to the brain. And then I can use this model to study the responses to the exercise pressure reflex. And this just shows an example of, of what this might look like in our lab. Here we have an animal where we statically contract the muscle. This is tension developed in the muscle over time. It's just a 30 second contraction. You see there's a good amount of tension developed. And this uh, elicits large increases in mean arterial pressure arterial blood pressure, and heart rate in this model. And again, what's nice about this is that because I'm electrically inducing the muscle contraction, there's no input from central command because, as I said, central command is an anticipatory response that I do while I'm consciously exercising. These animals are all anesthetized and not consciously exercising. And I can also bear denervate these animals so there's no input from the bare reflex. So we did just that. Our main question was, does the exercise pressure reflex contribute to the abnormal cardiovascular response to exercise in hypertension? So we're going to answer that question by doing muscle contraction and stimulating the exercise pressure reflex in normotensive and hypertensive rats. So we have two models here. We use normotensive Wistar Kyoto rats, okay? And then we use hypertensive spontaneously, or, or rats that become hypertensive, called spontaneously hypertensive rats. These rats are a good model of essential hypertension. Essential hypertension means if you or I got hypertension and the doctor can't figure out why we have it, then it's essential hypertension. We don't know what the real cause is. So this animal model, these SHR animals, are a good um, model for that. They become, they just, all of a sudden, at about eight weeks of age, they start to develop high blood pressure. By 14 weeks of age, it's extremely high, it levels off, and then they maintain this high pressure level throughout the remainder of their lives. And they can live to be very old. Um, anybody ever seen, uh, worked with rats? Nobody's ever worked with rats? You've worked with, one person has worked with rats? So anybody want to work with rats? You can come, come work for me in the lab. All right, great. They have cute pink eyes, these are all white, and they have those really nice long scaly tails, and it's always fun in the lab to work with the rats. And, <clears throat> anyway, so we took these two groups of animals, uh, normotensive WKY animals and hypertensive SHR animals. You can see their baseline blood pressures. The normotensive animals had a mean arterial pressure around 90 millimeters of mercury. The hypertensive animals had mean arterial pressures of about 150. So they were, in fact, hypertensive. And then we just stimulated the exercise press reflex by inducing that muscle contraction. And when we did that, here in the white bar is our normotensive animals, and the black bar is our hypertensive animals. To the same stimulus, so this is the same, they developed the same level of tension in the muscle when it contracted it, we get much larger increases in both heart rate and blood pressure in our hypertensive animals as compared to our normotensive animals. Now this is different from the first information I showed you in the humans because that was an integrated cardiovascular response that was exaggerated. This shows that this particular reflex contributes, it can drive that response, a similar response all on its own when it's preferentially activated. So this is good evidence that the exercise pressure reflex is indeed 
uh, contributes to the abnormal cardiovascular response to exercise in this disease. So our next question is, uh, I just told you there's two components to this reflex. If we want to someday try to uh, come up with good treatments and targets for treatments so that we can reduce these abnormal responses in humans, we have to understand fully what is driving these responses. So the first step to doing that is asking which component of that reflex, me mechanical reflex or metabolic reflex, mediates this overactivity and hypertension. <clears throat> and that's basically just to go back through the exercise pressure reflex arc. As I said, you have a uh, uh, contracting skeletal muscle that will activate a metabolically component and a mechanically component. Both of these contribute to exercise pressure reflex activity. Which one of these is driving this overactivity that we see in hypertension? So that's the question that we're asking. <clears throat> and to answer this question, uh, we uh, use the same animal prep. Okay? But this time, instead of stimulating the ventral roots and causing a muscle to contract, I'm just going to stretch this muscle. So I can just stretch it. When I stretch a muscle, I'm still causing it to deform, so I'm activating those uh, receptors in the muscle that are responsive to mechanical deformation. But the, I have the added bonus of, since I'm not actually doing any work, there's no metabolic byproducts being produced. And I'm just artificially stretching this muscle. And that is a way that, that is commonly used to preferentially activate those group 3 afferent neurons that are associated with mechanical reflex to see how they uh, respond. So I can isolate the, uh, the muscle mechanical reflex. And so when I do, did that, uh, here again, this is uh, our hypertensive animals in the black, our normotensive animals in the white. And here we did graded uh, responses at to 1 to 33 percent of maximal uh, tension development, 34 to 67 percent, and 68 to 100 percent. You can see that even at low levels of uh, stretch, we see larger increases in blood pressure in hypertensive compared to normotensive animals. That just becomes more and more of a larger gap the more intense the stretch was. Okay? <clears throat> we see the same profile and pattern uh, in response in our heart rate response. And this is actually a, a unique. Uh, we saw the same thing when we, we did graded responses to uh, skeletal muscle contraction. We uh, uh, isolated the exercise pressure reflex. And this was sort of suggests that um, it's not just at if we maximally contract our muscles. First of all, none of us physiologically can really ever maximally contract any muscle in our body. Um, we always do it at some greater level. We, d we never recruit all motor fibers at the same time. So uh, for this information to be applicable, we would like to see if there are changes at less intense, um, less intense intensities, at less intense or less stressful work, um, so that you may actually be able to translate this. You see these peaks in blood pressure and heart rate uh, during doing normal everyday activities like uh, walking or uh, grocery shopping, picking up a grocery bag or mowing the lawn or stuff like that. <clears throat> Which I don't get to do anymore because my 14 year old son now hijacks the lawnmower and does it all the time himself. Okay. So that was suggesting that the mechanical reflex does drive part of this exercise pressure reflex overactivity. Uh, what about the skeletal muscle metabol reflex? Okay, we're going to use a different strategy to uh, isolate or stimulate the metabol reflex. And what we're going to use here, you know these, I've told you these are chemically sensitive afferent fibers. Okay, so the receptors associated with these sensory fibers respond to different chemicals. Okay. <clears throat> It would be nice if we could target a particular receptor that's associated with those fibers so we could artificially drive the response. And there is one receptor that we have used for this. It's called the TRIP-V1 receptor. This TRIP-V1 receptor is located primarily in the group 4 afferent fibers or the sensory neurons that are um, uh, associated with the muscle metabol reflex. So if we can stimulate this re receptor and stimulate these afferent neurons, we can then look at differences between hypertensive and normotensive animals. Um, interesting thing about this particular receptor, um, it responds to capsaicin. Has anybody ever heard of capsaicin? Yes, I mean you probably go to your regular drugstore and you'll see something that's like a heat rub that called, what is it, capsi, capsaicin, they got some kind of drug, you know, name for it at the drugstore. Anyway, 
it's basically the active ingredient in red hot chili peppers. And um, when you extract it out, it actually preferentially activates this particular receptor. <clears throat> so how do we know that this particular receptor is involved with the muscle metabol reflex itself? We, we wouldn't want to target this receptor if we didn't know that it was involved with the actual muscle metabol reflex. So we did a series of studies where we did multiple contractions, and this is just in normal animals. Uh, we first did contractions when we introduced just saline into the circulation, okay? And if you do that, you see you get uh, increases in uh, tension that is not changed over several contractions. Heart rate response is not really changed. Blood pressure response not really changed. This is a control experiment. But if you then, instead of saline, gave a drug that would block this receptor called capsaicepine, um, you can see that here is when we don't give the drug, you get these nice increases in blood pressure and heart rate to a particular tension development. But if we then block this receptor, we significantly reduce the blood pressure and heart rate responses to the same level of tension development. So we know it's okay to target this receptor to drive these afferents. We know that these receptors are involved with the metabol reflex during exercise. <clears throat> So now we're going to artificially dry them to try to get some idea of what's going on with metabolic reflex. So we use uh, a little variation on that preparation that I showed you earlier in the rats. This is your abdominal aorta. Is everybody fairly familiar with their anatomy? So this is coming down and then we're going to go out into the two iliac arteries that are going to go to each one of our legs to perfuse our legs. Uh, we're going to introduce or we do introduce a